This is me, Elray. And this is my filmmaker brother, Magnus. And here we are in Independence, Missouri. We've just flown in from Norway to visit a place that is significant enough to draw people from all over the world. You can see the temple behind us. It was dedicated 25 years ago to the pursuit of peace, reconciliation and healing of the spirit. Visitors to 1840s Nauvoo would at times describe cannons in the Prophet Joseph Smith's yard. Shocking from today's perspective, but I think we need to put it in the context of the 1838 Mormon War in northern Missouri. We were deeply traumatized by those experiences. Uh, I believe, and some have argued, like Matthew Bolton, that, that we as a people suffered collective trauma from that violent experience. And so in Nauvoo, uh, we are making decisions through the lens of, of that trauma. Uh, so I, instead of judging the things we did in Nauvoo, I, I empathize with the people. I, I hurt for them. Uh, we were able, though, to turn again to the path to peace with Joseph III's leadership. But, and he, he maintained that path uh, through his death in 1914. Uh, but shortly after he died, just six, six months later, the beginnings of what would become World War I are occurring in Europe, and soon we're in World War II, and we as a people, uh, again, were overcome by the, the culture of violence surrounding us. Uh, and we embrace uh, violence as a means to solve our differences. Um, though, again, have returned to what I think is closer to the 1830s position uh, of we were not quite pacifists at that time, but deeply committed to peacemaking. Uh, and I, I feel like today, uh, Community of Christ World Conference, uh, we are in a place where Joseph III positioned us in 1865. Peace is eminently our mission. So here we are, El Rey, southeast corner of the temple. Um, Joseph Smith Jr., Sidney Rigdon and others came here in 1831 and dedicated this spot. This is the highest spot for miles around. Uh, it's over a thousand feet. The idea of going up to the temple from Isaiah chapter 2, that's uh, echoing here. And then the Church of Christ temple lot just over here, They've been stewards of this plot for uh, over a hundred years. Uh, they represent the earliest phase of church organization. I think of them representing 1830, 1833. The saints come here uh, and are driven out in 1833. Um, the Kirtland era continues and Community of Christ with the temple and the auditorium, they identify with the Kirtland era up to 1837. Mm. And then the LDS Church Visitors Center just over here um, represents 1839 to 1844. So the temple was never built here, but the longing of our people in the whole movement wanted 
this temple to be built. And so that's why the RLDS temple or the Community of Christ temple is here. So we talk a lot about the Kirtland Temple because the purposes of the Kirtland Temple is where we went to in, in understanding temple. So a place for community gathering, a place for worship and education, a place to come together and experience community together and experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in a sense, it's like an endowing of spirit similar to Pentecost, and w which is similar to the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. And then ascending out into the world to um, partner with God to accomplish God's dream for the world of peace, Zion. This whole building is dedicated to the pursuit of peace. That's the purpose, and it has a transforming effect on our, our people because we're a people now dedicated to the pursuit of peace. The, the other temple is the whole people of God. I'm thinking about the 25th anniversary of the temple dedication and what kind of meaning uh, we would need to emphasize and hold up for people. Uh, and then, then secondly, just my own ongoing quest to understand uh, where the church is at in its development and what vision will continue to faithfully guide the church as well as motivate people to respond. And one of the challenges is, is connecting the story of what has occurred, the, the sacred story, the history, with meaning for the future so we're not just stuck in time. Um, as a church, we understand ourselves as not being static or stayed, but that we are a movement, and, and movement means we are always trying to discern more about uh, the will and purposes of God. So that profound moment, nearly 200 years ago, 199 years ago, uh, when Joseph was a young 14-year-old boy, troubled about questions, went into the woods uh, to pray on a beautiful spring day in May, 1820, and had a vision. So we start the worshiper's path, our entry into the temple, um, with this uh, beautiful glasswork reminiscent of that grove experience. So we begin our worship acknowledging that uh, seminal experience of a 14-year-old boy that starts our whole movement. The temple um, is a, a resource for us uh, to stimulate our reflection and to keep raising possibilities in terms of our understanding of the gospel in the world. I love the Exodus story where Moses encounters the burning bush. The burning bush is aflame but not consumed. Moses hears um, the Holy Spirit speak to the burning bush and tell him to take off his shoes, he's standing on holy ground. So it's a moment of huge worship and he, Moses also hears the Spirit saying, I am the God of your father and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and I'm showing up in your generation too. It's a profound moment for Moses. And then he hears the Holy Spirit say, the Lord say, I've heard the cries of my people. I've seen their suffering and I've come down to deliver them. And Moses, I need you to go and talk to Pharaoh. And Moses says, I can't, I stutter. I'm not a politician. But Pharaoh will laugh at me. He always did when I grew up in Pharaoh's household. So he feels totally inadequate, but that's the whole point. It's by God's power. This is a profound story in the Bible. I'm so grateful that we have it. If I was Pharaoh, if I was a rich person, I would make sure this story was repressed, suppressed, but it's not, it's out in the open. 
So God is on the side of the poor uh, slaves. You can't be poorer than a slave. You don't even own your own body. So this is a really wonderful way of beginning uh, our journey of the worshipper's path. Peace must be correlated with justice for the poorest human being. I never feel particularly holy enough to come into the temple. But this uh, story reminds me that God is a loving Father being who is ready to run and embrace me. We can step into this ourselves and be embraced by a loving God who has run towards us to welcome us here. So as I was reflecting on all of that, uh, I had an interesting experience, which was the Spirit drawing me back into inspired counsel that had been given to the church in the past, either by my uh, predecessors or some that I've been called upon to share. And seeing certain parts of it uh, illuminated or, or magnified or emphasized in print, it would be bold print, uh, as in enduring meaning that we needed to continue to bring careful attention to. And there were certain phrases that, that stood out about peace and, and reconciliation, um, spiritual renewal in the church that, that went beyond just a physical structure in which significant worship and fellowship and learning occurs, referring to the temple, to the temple as a symbol for a continued journey into understanding the essence of Jesus Christ and Christ's ministry um, and the particular themes of that ministry. What does the cross mean for us? Um, of course, we'll never exhaust the meaning of atonement and uh, uh, the rich symbolism in this, this, uh, this cross. I'm really glad this is not a pretty cross because the cross is ugly. It's the, it's the electric chair, it's the hangman's noose, it's the firing squad. Executions still happen today and we need to remember that Jesus was executed. The cross reminds me that Christians have to be against the death penalty because God in Jesus suffered the death penalty. Jesus um, is crucified because he turns over the tables in the uh, temple. So Jesus um, was standing up for justice against the corrupt temple system. So that's also a meaning of the cross here. We should also have courage to stand up for justice. So this is the tree of life from the book of Revelation and the leaves, it says, are for the healing of the nations. So uh, I love this symbol here. The tree of life is present in Judaism, is present in Islam, it's present in Christianity, it's present in the Book of Mormon too. Mm. So it's in our tradition as well. So the artist is Muslim. So I think it's very cool on this uh, worshippers path, we have uh, something from a Muslim artist. In a way it may seem very different than the founding roots of our movement and at the same time it really rings true to me that part of what Joseph Smith um, felt was, was this sense to really try to take hold of who Jesus was and what Jesus was revealing to us about the nature of God in his life and ministry. So there's a group of women trained in this uh, Japanese uh, way of arranging flowers um, that does this every week. It's mm -hmm. always beautiful. Uh, and there's three levels, there's heaven, the sky, there's earth. And uh, it's very simple as well. This reminds me that 
that God and humans together can do something very beautiful. So sometimes people come to the temple in their darkest times, um, desperate for help. Maybe a personal struggle, maybe some issue in their family, maybe loss of jobs, maybe guilt, uh, some kind of personal struggle. So these three statues are uh, helping people know that God loves them and can help them at the darkest time of struggle. So there's a reassurance that God can meet uh, everyone, no matter where they are on their journey. This is a, assuring people that it's not superficial grace. Mm. It's taking into account our real concrete human struggles uh, that we at some time in our lives all wrestle with, perhaps. I think being a people of the temple is a people who uh, live out uh, God's shalom in the world. I like the term shalom better than peace. Shalom is a much richer term. Uh, and that means be able to be involved in people's lives so that they can flourish and be what God intended them to be. It means being able to reconcile with others, uh, reconcile with ourselves and the issues we face, reconcile with our families and uh, our workmates, uh, reconcile with creation, and reconcile and restore relationships with God. And then it, being a people of the temple means to be able to heal and be able to exercise sorrow and to lament and to engage in all the hurts of people and be able to bring healing. So we try to fill the hole in our souls with lots of material things. That's why there's an environmental crisis. That's why capitalism and its hoarding of wealth uh, creates so much misery in our world. So Jesus is promising that he can fill the hole in our soul. The hole in our soul is an infinite need of longing for the divine, but we don't know it. We go out of worship and see our task is to thrust in our sickle, as it were. The fields are ripe to harvest. People are ready for our peace message, our, our message of peace and justice, of creating that in the world, because so many people are struggling with oppression and sadness and war and poverty. We have a task to do as we leave worship, and this window reminds us of that. I think there are a lot of images of who Jesus is. Some are very personal as one savior and you know that's appropriate. Some are nationalistic. Uh, some are even militaristic. So humans have created images of Jesus to fit the human uh, agenda or human needs. The temple gives us an image of Jesus that says redemption comes through sacrificial love, living that out in reconciliation between persons and, and groups and nations, and striving for wholeness in life. And so the redemption occurs through what Jesus demonstrated in his own life in terms of compassion, reconciliation, forgiveness, building inclusive community. That's how the world is redeemed. 
Here we have the church seal on these doors, the bronze doors. Each one of these three doors weighs 16 tons. Yet a child can open these doors. The idea is in worship is that we come out of these doors after worship, inspired by worship to be, make peace in the world. This church seal with lion, lamb, and a little child leading them is really important visual theology for our tradition. Uh, without this visual theology, we wouldn't have a peace mission. Without this visual theology of the church seal, we wouldn't have this soaring temple spire up to 300 feet dedicated to the pursuit of peace, reconciliation, and healing of the Spirit. We wouldn't have that dedication, that purpose, except for this church seal. Here we are. I want you to see these 50 trees here. And the trees are ginkgo biloba, and they're found by uh, Buddhist temples all over East Asia. It's a peace tree. Hiroshima, mm -hmm. 1945, ground zero. Six ginkgo trees uh, survived the atom blast without mutation. So it's also a tree of resurrection, a tree of hope. The Independence Temple is an important symbol to us of our journey of a Restoration people and our deepening understanding of what restoration is and how God calls us to be part of that restoring influence in the world today. This is not something that is a human agenda, but this is actually insight into the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, and it's calling our attention to it. And I think the Community of Christ story is different to the Quakers and the Mennonites. We participated in violence in northern Missouri. Um, we had an army of 5,000 people, 5,000 men in Nauvoo. So we have this militant legacy. Now, Jesus III starts to distance it, uh, us from that. But it's very powerful. Uh, I think it's a very powerful story that we're a violent church that is repenting and has now ended up in a peace position or ending up towards a peace position, a nonviolent position. This gives hope in the world for lots of religions that have also had violent histories. We're not a pure peace church, but praise God, we're a repenting peace church. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. From Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4.